Hello everyone and welcome to the 27th episode of the Serbs of the Week podcast where we discuss all possible topics around SEO. I have the pleasure to introduce our very special guest, uh, Kevin Gibbons. Kevin is the founder and CEO of ResSignals, an award-winning e-commerce SEO agency that has helped well-known brands such as ASICS, Expedia, Under Armour, and much more. Kevin, thank you very much for joining you for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Great to be here. And um, no, very good, thank you. So yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. Yeah, me too, me too, right? Since you have such an extensive background working with so many awesome brands, right? Uh, I'd love to learn more about this. And uh, But uh, as usual, right, we have our very first as an icebreaker question, right? Which will be, um, uh, why did you choose SEO, right, over some other marketing disciplines? Um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know if I chose SEO. I think I kind of fell into it. <laughs> And I think a lot of people maybe have said the same, um, but I was a student actually at university. I did a placement year in between before I completed my course. And um, it was at that point in time, I thought I wanted to be a web developer and mm. I worked at a web design agency and they started getting into SEO. So yeah, in 2003 and um, they were making it up as I went along like everyone else was at that point in time and it was a really interesting way to kind of get insight into what was a very new industry at that point in time because obviously Google was like 98 so five years into that Google had started to make waves as a popular search engine but um yeah it it felt exciting I felt like honestly I was okay at web development but I really wasn't great I wasn't that passionate about it. I didn't enjoy it. But there was something about SEO and being able to make changes and seeing how that would impact a website almost within the next day that I just found kind of... It was, it was back those crazy. days and everything was very fast, right? Oh, it was, yeah. You could change. I had quite a lot of case studies where I changed the homepage title tag to the keyword they wanted to rank for and they'd go from nowhere to like number one. And I've... I've had emails from people saying like you're a genius <laughs> like looking back I wasn't a genius those days were easy so uh yeah it but I think that that got me hooked that was like okay well this is working this is really really good and um obviously from there I took that into building my own websites making affiliate income and then turning that later into a consultancy and then an agency so you used to be right uh, an affiliate marketer. So you used to build like um, niche websites, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I found that such a good way to just test and learn and break a few things, see what happens, try a few things, and not have to worry about sign off. You can push the boundaries quite a lot when you've got your own affiliate kind of yeah. test websites. But I found, I mean, back then. I did a year traveling in Australia and I made my salary through affiliate income and a small amount of consulting. And that paid for me to spend a year in Australia. So it's like, I found <laughs> no, that, that was, was very nice, right? A good way to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you were just kind of, you were back to the UK and you decided to launch an agency, right? Yeah. Well, to be honest, my plan was to get a job. And then I realized when I got back, uh -huh. I had one. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so it's better point, to be on your own right <laughs> yeah and it, i i probably up until that point wouldn't class myself as an entrepreneur it was kind of more like i say fell into it was curious tried a few things and then like i say realized when i was looking for a job that i actually already had one <laughs> and figured well why don't i carry on yeah. and see where this ends up yeah yeah well yeah it's just kind of yeah i agree it's it's a quite fascinating right field where you can learn quite a lot on your own for sure i think a lot of things have changed right from the very beginning right when it was you know quite easy i would say right so changing a few things right now a lot of things of um are affecting right um, the final outcome and also the time right between your changing something and seeing the changes it has changed quite a lot right oh, yeah. um yeah, well, do, and by the way, uh, may I ask you, right, because I noted that 
um, with the, you know, with the rise of AI content, right? And especially whenever we are talking about quite big, and it doesn't matter, might be quite small, quite big websites, right? The, the indexing thing, right, is kind of um, becoming quite an issue just because, um, you know, the, the pages are not really indexed um, in a timely manner, I would say, right? So mm -hmm. do you see the same kind of a trend across your client's websites, right? When it comes to the time when you change things and when you kind of, you know, the gap between uh, seeing, right, kind of, you know, the Google picking up this page, I would say, right? And you mm -hmm. can see the change. Oh, absolutely. You, you could definitely, like I say, the early days, I would make a change one day probably wouldn't even like back then you wouldn't even have search console or webmaster tools or anything it would just be you'd wait until it gets picked up from a sitemap probably a html sitemap as well i'm not even sure xml was <laughs> a thing in the early days so um but it, it was very much you would make that change then you'd see an impact and a result immediately um now it's very much we've had a few clients over the last year where Google have made a change to their algorithm, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, certainly from our opinion. I'm sure there's good stories and bad stories from each of those updates, but we've been on the receiving end of a few. There was one in particular last year where a brand mm -hmm. that we're working with stopped ranking for their brand plus product keywords. And it was it was hard that, to describe. That is harsh, right? Very, that is very, very harsh. harsh. Um, we, in that situation... They didn't rank. They didn't drop for all of the keywords. In fact, you would have the exact product plus brand they might rank for. But mm. if you change the order of that keyword phrase, they'd completely disappear. It was same URL, same, um, very similar search term, just in a different order. So it's just because of uh, the, the order of the words, right? So nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. And when we looked at it, we were kind of like, okay, well, I know there's a load of things technically we can do better. It's on the roadmap. We want to fix them. I don't think any of these have actually had a major impact to this because it's their brand. They should still be ranking. And in a lot of cases, they are still ranking. But in that situation, it was a case of we need to do our best, but we're pretty confident we've done the right thing. We're just waiting for Google to make that change. And the next time there's a refresh, they'll update it. We did. We messaged Google at the time. Um, I find with Google quite often you don't always get a response, but sometimes they look at it and they just don't tell you. Um, and quite quickly after that, the results did start to return, which was great. But like you say, sometimes now... Did, did Google right reply something to you? I don't think they did. It was someone in our team that messaged them. Um, oh, no, they okay. did. They did reply, actually. They replied to say um, they would look into it. Um, I think they looked interesting. They didn't reply to say that they'd done anything about it but within a week and a half to two weeks the rankings were restored so we i think maybe they looked at it they either way maybe probably. it was just a technical mistake i think something like you know because you know at the end of the day you know all those updates they're created by developers and if you are worked with developers in, in kind of you know in your life you know that you know that there might be so many stupid situations when they you you've been assuming this to be delivered in this way, but they're kind of you know doing it in a completely different way, right? One way I would say, right? The logic is not there sometimes. Yeah, and it, and I get why the communication isn't always there because you can't tell everyone this is what you've done, this is what's gone wrong because again, people will. You you maybe, can't really go through oh. all the possible cases, right? That is the problem because. Yeah. Sometimes you think it's so logical, right, to do it in that way. So it's going to actually solve, right, a lot of points, I would say, right, or take, kind of, you know, checking a lot of boxes at the same time. But uh, developer, they think in a completely different way. Exactly. And I, but I think to your point about things just take a bit longer now. They do. You do have to have patience that we've done the right thing. It might not have a positive impact within the first day certainly within the first few weeks or even months but if you do the right thing when that next algorithm update comes around then that's where you're kind of hoping that you get rewarded and it might not be the next one it might be three or four down the line but again it's kind of trying to do what you think is the right thing and then um, making sure that you get rewarded for it hopefully in the longer term but um, it's harder mm. to see 
okay, we're going to make these changes today. And by the end of March, like obviously right now being February, um, that's all going to be fine and your traffic's going to go up by 20%. It's like you can't, you can only speculate and estimate on these types of things, but it's it's largely out of your control, if not fully. <laughs> yeah, for sure, right. But how long does it so take nowadays? Right. So I have kind of, yeah. you know, I know that the right answer will be depends, right? But on a general note, especially whenever we work with big science, right? And you have quite right a good number of big science, right? Whenever you change something, what are your expectations? What will be the an average time frame, right? In the e-commerce bit for sure. Yeah, I think it's it does depend, but I think there's a way to answer that more specifically in the case of where the problems lie if you've got a website that has fundamental technical issues and you fix those technical issues i would like to think that you would see a probably a recovery if you've dropped in visibility um in i always class a short term in seo as being kind of like three to six months i think any one to three months is really hard to say anything will happen i think you can probably say within a three to six month range if we do the right mm-hmm. thing i think you can see an impact from that um, medium term, kind of more six to 12 months. And then longer term could be anything between one and two years, maybe longer if you're really ambitious in the targets and you've got a low starting point. Um, equally, I think I've seen websites the other way around where they might have a very strong brand and link reputation, but they just don't have good content and creating content mm. around, say, top of funnel awareness um topics i think can really help them to attract traffic because they now have content around those those phrases that will attract traffic and they they're in a a strong position where they could rank for it so again that might be something that could have a shorter term impact longer term Mm -hmm. i think trying to build the reputation of a brand through say um link and link reputation and brand awareness that's where I think it's quite tricky to say anything meaningful. In yeah, terms because of you don't really know how long does it take for Google to identify your domain as a brand entity, right? So that is the problem. Exactly. And most yeah. probably that, you know, and I think uh, nowadays it's it's kind of, you know, the delay, right, is, is kind of growing, I would say, between the moment yeah, you create a website, right? Till the moment you will be really uh, associated uh, as you know as something like meaningful, right? Exactly, um, and and stuff like that is normally it's not about having a campaign spike. It's about a consistent effort over time. So if you've got a spike of links that have happened over a two or three week period, that could could well be a positive, but it's probably not going to be a positive within. Um, yeah, kind of the weeks of that campaign going live, it's probably more likely to be if you have a sustained effort and you can prove that that brand is link worthy and people are searching for the brand name in Google and it's good signals that are going through in terms of brand awareness, then um, then over time you can start to see that or Google would see, okay, well, this is a brand mm-hmm. you should pay more attention to and maybe up waiting. But yeah, I, I think the campaign spike is unlikely to have a major impact. I'm sure there's case studies mm-hmm. that are exceptions to that rule, but in general, I think it's the uh, it's always like the continuous pressure of building up that brand over over a period of time. Yeah, but I think right, you know, for the commerce niche, I might be wrong because we don't really work much with them. But I think recommendations. I mean, like real clients' recommendation on those aggregators and just across the web might be playing uh, as kind of, you know, can be really close to the real links in terms of their importance. Yeah. Because do, do, have, you, have you seen, right, you know, the, the kind of the impact of those recommendations, especially if you ever had, uh, let's say, a client with very few of recommendation and you started creating right, um, you know, accounts on the right websites where people can live, um, you know, like, you know, similar to G2, but, you know, for for the e-commerce brands, right? There are some sites uh, like working like aggregators and so on. Yeah. Um, honestly, no, that's just not something that we've been involved in ourselves. So I, I almost mm. feel like I don't, 
necessarily have an opinion on it because it for mm. us it, the work that we typically do is some of our clients have PR in-house teams mm. or traditional agencies that they work with and it's partnering together yeah, with okay. others it's probably more about we would create content for them that attracts and earns links and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some of the outreach driven some of it just creating topics that we know will be mm -hmm. linked back to as a resource but on the aggregator front I know sometimes there's there's issues where aggregators can potentially take away traffic that you would have got otherwise because you mm. could end up sometimes you might end up outranked by a Yahoo or I don't know if MSN mm -hmm. or some of the big aggregator sites um they might link back so to it's you a little bit trickier but, right but yeah they're, they're certainly taking away some traffic um I think when you look into maybe more of the publisher side of Google News and where that traffic's going again it's mm -hmm. It's weighing up the data and understanding the pros and the cons of, um, yeah, kind of how that's working for you. But what will be, be, in your opinion, the best way of getting, uh, right? Because if you put those uh, clients' recommendations on your website, yep. it's kind of good, but not really trustworthy if you want to, if you know what I mean, it's just the same. Whenever you, you kind of, you know, as a client, I want to see something not affiliated, right, with the business, yep. uh, because I want to, kind of right uh, see it somewhere else just to get you know uh, a different kind of perspective right whenever i do a research and uh, what will be the best way then exactly. to, because if you end up with kind of right feeding this aggregator with your recommendation then this aggregator will be outranking you by the brain that search term that is not good right oh of course yeah i i think ultimately it it always comes back to how do you build the right brand? So for us with clients, we've had, we've had pieces of content that have been, we haven't done any outreach to, but we've created it on a top of funnel awareness um, topic. Mm -hmm. And we've got pages that have links from a number of authority domains and publishers. We've had, um, yeah, kind of, and, and over time it just increases because it, it ranks highly in Google that, people see that as a resource and they link back to it mm -hmm. ultimately it's still it's building a brand it's what you do online offline content wise on your website obviously the technical side is really important um link building has a, a a role to play um but it's part of the mix i think it's not trying just to do one thing and hoping it's going to change everything about your business it's how do you um how do you combine that together and make sure that you're you're strong in all of those key areas? Yeah, yeah, it's my concern. By the way, I just want to uh, want to ask since you do guys digital PR, right, uh, for your clients, I just want to ask about those campaigns. Do you see that they work like a one-time source of links, right? Because you create something newsworthy, I would say, right? It's just kind of your outreach, this getting links. And then in order to kind of, right, if you want to um, create one more time a flow of links, additional flow of links on top of what, you know, your clients are getting, you have to create a new campaign or you have been successful into maybe repurposing those campaigns or kind of making them as link magnets in some ways. We, I would say we used to do a lot more digital PR than we do now. Um but that said, I think our approach now is much more evergreen content. So if mm. if we run a campaign and it gets X amount of links, I don't know, somewhere between, say, 25 and 50 links or something like that, typically mm -hmm. that's the type of thing that's topical. So journalists are talking about this. It's interesting to them, but it's quite short-lived. So those types of campaigns, I think, have their place, certainly if you want to attract links from a number of target publishers. But what we found is creating content that is a bit more evergreen serves a purpose mm -hmm. for itself. So it has a double benefit that it generates that top of funnel awareness and then equally it will attract and earn links over time. So there's, like I said, a piece of content we've created for a client two years ago. And I think that mm -hmm. had 90, maybe over a hundred links now. Um, and we've mm -hmm. never done out, we've never done any outreach for it. We've, what kind we've, of content that was? It was a um, a running guide in terms of 
what you need to do so this is for asics and oh yeah uh, for sure it's a very big brand so it's kind of you know it's always like a combination of things because if you put yeah. this running guide on a website very small one right so that you know people don't really know then for sure right the chances of getting linked but for sure because you know that is the right brand and the right content exactly. so i think uh, the, the brand content plays a significant role here whenever you are kind of even considering whether you want to because link is kind of a recommendation right and yeah. whenever you considering something right to give a recommendation then it should be you know the the the, the place right that uh, you know beside the content right that the website the domain the brand should be good as well exactly yeah yeah it all works together absolutely and i think that's the thing it's um it's not trying to do seo in a silo it's trying to bring it into um that overall brand to the point that i always think with this type of stuff if you're creating great content it shouldn't be hidden on part of the website that you can't get to from anywhere else it should be actually how do you build that into the navigation or into the blog how do you maybe you get the social team to share about it from the brand it shouldn't just be okay you can have a subdomain or a subfolder and do seo stuff to it <laughs> it's like that that just sounds very dated i think it should be very much it's part of your overall strategy and then that you can see where that fits into the bigger picture yeah for sure it's it's making a lot of sense then even though right it might create a competition because sometimes right you want to run for the same set of keywords by your category pages something like that but still i think right you know you shouldn't be afraid of cannibalization or something like that because i think the pages they are completely different so they are kind of serving different needs right in this sense exactly and i wanted yeah and wanted to ask about content right do you guys um do any ai content right do you use any ai technologies when it comes to creating content because you know it's nowadays it's a hot topic right everyone is talking about this and i think right for the e-commerce niche it might be a good way of solving some problems for sure right depends on how you're going to use it so i just wanted to ask about this yeah so there's a couple of ways of looking at this and we've got different clients who look at this differently as well so we have one client that we work with that we have a innovation roadmap. There's a number of efficiencies that we're working on with them using AI and various types of technology to drive, mm -hmm. to drive efficiencies in our work. And I would say it's, um, it's very much how do we keep the same quality of work, but how do we make that more efficient? It's not how do we find shortcuts and do things quicker mm -hmm. but sacrifice quality that's absolutely not the mm -hmm. way that we would approach that um and i know there's ways that you could certainly create mass content at scale using ai absolutely um but that's not what we're getting in that for we we've got other clients in similar spaces where in their contracts they will say under no circumstances must you use ai um, because they're very much risk averse and they don't want to be involved in it I don't mm -hmm. think at this point in time there's necessarily a right or wrong answer because it's so new. Some people are some people are at the other end of the scale where it is, let's just do everything that we can and see what we can get away with. Like, like I say, that's not us, mm -hmm. uh, but people are doing that, and I'm sure people are doing well out of that right now. Um, and it will be to be seen in terms of how, how well and how long that lasts. Um, some clients at the other end of the scale where it's, we don't want to touch this, let everyone else test it. And then we'll figure out what to do if we want to do it for longer term. And then some are in the middle where it's maybe there's an 80, 20 rule, 80% 80 of what you do is tried and tested. 20% is okay. Well, how do we get more efficient? How do we try and evolve? And I would say that's where we are with some of our clients right now. Um, we're not using AI to create content. We are using it in terms of the research and the insights we've used it to create writer briefs for example where previously mm -hmm. we had a, an seo consultant in our team that would be taking the keyword research and creating a brief for a writer i think on average mm -hmm. that's 15 minutes or so per page um and now that's something that we can automate we'll still oversee it we'll quality control it but we can make that more mm -hmm. efficient so I, I see that as a big positive because 
then we can do more with our time strategically. Um, and it makes some of the kind of like the tasks that just don't necessarily need someone with 10 years worth of experience to, uh, to be overseeing yeah, sure. time on. So I think if, if we can build models and technology that helps us to be more efficient, I personally think that's a great thing, but equally we've got clients where there's a lot at stake. They pay us to get an ROI and obviously it's about a return investment for them. And yeah. we, don't, we don't want to be playing with fire in terms of this is new. We don't know how it's going to work. So, but we're going to test it. It feels like we've got the wrong client set to be making those types of risks on. Um, so yeah, we will use it, but for efficiencies rather than mm-hmm. scale, rather than scaling and pushing the boundaries. If I was going back yeah. to my days getting started with affiliate websites, I would probably <laughs> be all, all over how do you create as much content as possible and scale it using AI just because it's interesting. <laughs> and if it didn't work, yeah, for sure. um, it's a test experiment that you've learned from. But like I say, it's harder to put that into the wild with clients. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's different places for different approaches. Yeah, yeah, it's making a lot of sense. And I have the very last question, right, um, which is related to e-commerce and the future, right, of SEO, right? So what do you think, Kevin, is the future of SEO in the e-commerce industry, right? Knowing all the challenges um, as a state, is especially whenever you're a brand new um, domain, right, a brand new company and you still want to kind of somehow rent collect traffic and so on so what do you think about that yeah so i would start by answering this as no one knows what the future holds no matter what (laughs) anyone tells you it is a prediction and you can look at the you can look at the signs of where things are going um i do quite often i know jeff bezos from amazon has a famous quote on this of where he looks at not what's going to change, but what's not going to change. And in his his, um, model, that was very much customers will want convenience and they want the cheapest price. So for Amazon, they doubled down on Amazon prime to get delivery and um, obviously their centers um, as slick as possible. And they had the buying power that allowed them to provide cheap prices. So, um, I think there's an element in SEO. I I personally think Google faces quite a lot of challenges from other platforms. Um, obviously, in the past, a lot of people have talked about kind of meta, whether that's Facebook, Instagram. You now have mm-hmm. TikToks, obviously, rising in popularity. Um, just the way that people search for, for products, I think, is something to certainly pay attention to because... I think in terms of, um, yeah, kind of like that whole experience, it's not all going to be on Google. You can't just say, look, we're going to capture the user journey at every search because there'll be other platforms at play as well as just Google. So I think you need to look at that. And um, then we have also TikTok, right? Which is exactly. um, a new kid, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I think it's a growing trend and it's something that, again, I, I think deserves attention. Um Equally, I think in terms of where transactions come from, I think Google is always going to be likely, if not the strongest, um, one of the strongest. So I don't really see that changing, certainly in the even like medium term, maybe long term, but even that's hard to see. But I think transactional search, I don't see going away. I think the use of AI um, and certainly like what, Google look like they're going to roll out in terms of SGE is probably going to take away the middle layer of people that are creating average content. Um, yeah. But five things you need to know when you go skiing, like that type of thing that is just a copywriter that does five minutes research and writes an article that can be replaced by AI. The real value is in number one, the transactional content. And I think there might be more integration into shopping i know like tiktok is a good example i think you can buy products off of tiktok now through their own stores um mm-hmm. amazon i think it's like 50 percent of e-commerce or retail sales i think are on amazon so mm-hmm. again platforms um 
But I think the other end of that scale is actually the EEAT, so the expertise um, in particular in terms of just how do you build that expertise into your content so that it deserves mm -hmm. to rank. But equally, it's that type of content that AI can't replace because if you're asking someone with 20 years of experience about a subject, then it's certainly if you're thinking about, say, video content as well as text-driven content, um, I think that's where it's still going to have a lot of value. People will want to, if it's a complex subject, they'd want to read a, a long-form article, maybe a book, maybe a podcast, um, maybe listen to a YouTube video, um, that type of thing. And I, I think that's where AI, certainly at this stage, will likely fall short because it's good at the quick answers. Um, but the more in-depth content that you need, I think that's the area to double down on from a brand perspective. Um, but also, yeah, like I say, being aware of what might disappear and what you might not be able to rely on that you have done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kevin, for such an insightful conversation, for sharing your perspective on the future of the commerce niche and the rest of other topics. Thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate this. And yeah, cool. um, yeah, and wishing you a very nice day. You too. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.